Good morning. Welcome to worship. I just have a few announcements, very important campers, if you could listen carefully, to make sure that you take everything that you should be taking. And many times we seem to forget our instruments. So remember where your instrument was left last night and make sure you do that. There is a grab and go lunch uh, at the dining room for those who would like to take it with them. You just go when you're ready and loaded. And also we encourage you to do your surveys. We do have one young man who's lost his Pokemon discs. And uh, if you find them, let me know, okay? We're taking the offering again on behalf of the Music and Missions, the CMI Fund, and uh, we, I invite you to listen attentively as Peter gives us an offertory. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for the many opportunities we've had this week, and uh, we are so fortunate in so many ways. We just pray that we would be generous in our giving uh, for those who are in need or would really enjoy this experience. So help us in our giving this morning. Amen. Good morning, everyone. Please ask you to stand with us as we worship this morning. the power 
of sin and darkness, who love is mighty and so much stronger, the King of glory, the King above all kings. Who shakes the whole earth with holy thunder, who leaves us breathless and all and wonder, the King of glory, the King above all kings. This is amazing grace. This is unfailing love. That you would take my place. That you would bear my cross. You lay down your life. That I'll be set free. Oh, Jesus, I sing all that you've done for me Who brings our chaos back into order Who makes an orphan a son and daughter The King of glory, the King of glory Who is the nations with truth and justice, shine like the sun in all of His brilliance. The King of glory, the King of all kings. This is amazing grace. This is a failing love. That You would take my place. That You would bear my cross. You lay down your life, that I'll be set free. Oh, Jesus, I sing for all that you've done for me. Worthy is the Lamb who is slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the Grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy, worthy, worthy. This is amazing grace. This is a failing love That you would take my place That you would bear my cross You lay down your life That I would be set free Oh, Jesus, I sing for All that you've done for me All that you've done for me. All that you've done for me.
call to worship today is in Psalm 139. You have searched me, Lord, and you know me. You know when I sit and when I rise. You perceive my thoughts from afar. You discern my going out and my lying down. You are familiar with all my ways. Before a word is on my tongue, you, Lord, know it completely. You hem me in behind and before. You lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me, too lofty for me to attain. Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there your hand will guide me, your right hand will hold me fast. Before I speak, O oh Lord, you We're going to take uh, this a few moments now to gather um, in our last small group session. And today we are talking about the sacrament of living and what it means for us. Now that we have pursued God, now that we have explored how we can see him and know him and have faith in him, now we want to know how we might live for him. So um, that's not just for what we are doing today. What, we're, what we will be doing as we return home later this afternoon. So um, for our friends and visitors, we will have our small group questions up on the screen. So if you can gather in small groups as well with someone nearby you 
and discuss the questions as our student small groups gather. That would be um, much appreciated and hopefully will be a wonderful time of sharing for you as well. So at this time, we would invite you to gather with your small groups and take this time to share with one another.
can be you can do anything if you put your mind to it. I can do I can be in recycling. Do you? Yeah. Full heart of me. No, I mean, do you recycle? Well, yeah, for, for sure. Well, sometimes, but you know, other times I just forget. But I definitely believe in it. Can we get back to the game? I believe in being nice. I believe in helping people. How do you help people? The usual. Mm. You mean like volunteering at a shelter, tutoring after school, visiting shut-ins, delivering fruit baskets, and like offering help to the disabled? Yes, yes, I believe in those things. Do you do them? Are you playing this game or not? I believe in proper diet and exercise. I absolutely believe that I eat as well as I can. And I exercise every week. Or at least I think about it. And sometimes I get to the gym and other times I'm just busy. You know? And I, I believe in diet and exercise. I just said that. Fine. I believe in voting. All the time? For the important elections, yes. It's your turn. I believe in God. I believe in Jesus. How do you believe? You know what? I don't want to play this game anymore. You obviously don't know how to play. They're just statements of belief. You don't have to back them up. You're right. I don't know how to play that game. Booth Chorale and, and the Hilltop Chorus are coming into their places just now. They're going to share a song with you entitled, My Life is in Your Hands. The words and music are by Kirk Franklin and the arrangement by Carol Simbala from Brooklyn Tabernacle. This is not a particularly difficult song, but the beauty is in its simplicity. Here are the words. You don't have to worry and don't you be afraid. Joy comes in the morning troubles they don't last always. For there's a friend named Jesus who will wipe your tears away. And if your heart is broken, just lift your hands and say, oh, I know that I can make it because my life is in your hands. As the choir sing this this morning, you'll hear a lot of repetition. The same phrase keeps coming back. My life is in your hands. My life is in your hands. And the style of music, the gospel style of music has a lot of reiteration in it. And there's a reason for that. It kind of lays on our hearts and kind of stays with us. And that's what I love so much about this style of music. Not only the passion that's contained in there and the testimony of faith that is contained in the music, but also the fact that we can take it home with us. It lives with us for a few days. So as you get to hear that refrain that keeps coming back, I would ask that you just, you sing along if you wish to. You silently sing along if you wish to. But most importantly, that maybe you think this morning of something in your life that is troubling you, something that is laying heavy on your heart. And take this message to your heart and may it encourage you and strengthen you this morning. My life is in your hands.
pod, you know me. Inside and out, through and through, everything I do, every thought that flits through my mind, every step I take, every plan I make, every word I speak, you know, even before things happen, you know my past, you know my present. Your circumventing presence covers my every move. Your knowledge of me sometimes comforts me, sometimes frightens me, but always it is beyond my comprehension. There is no way to escape you, no place to hide. If I ascend to the heights of joy, you are there before me. If I am plunged into the depths of despair, you are there to meet me. I could fly to the other side of the world and you would be there to lead the way. I could walk in the darkest of nights and you're there to lighten its dismal hours. You were present at my very conception. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. From beginning to end, nothing was hid from your eyes. How fearful, how wonderful it all is.
600 minutes. Does anybody know what the significance of that number is? It's a year, that's right, the minutes in a year. It's uh, actually taken from a song, Seasons of Love, from Rent. 525,600 minutes, that's a lot of minutes. I wonder what you do with your year, your minutes, your thousands of minutes. I've been having the privilege of being able to talk to a number of members of staff and just sit and chat and just enjoy some fellowship time with them over this last uh, 10 days or so. And uh, I've got into a conversation a couple of times about seasons, um, seasons of life, different chapters of our lives. And I wanted to share a little bit about some of those seasons of my life where the Lord has been so very prevalent, where I have felt his presence. The first one, however, relates to Psalm 139. You watched me as I was being formed in utter seclusion. You saw me before I was born, and every day of my life was recorded in your book. My husband, who's not able to be here with me um, this week, and whom I have missed, so if he's watching on live stream, love you, Steve, miss you, coming home tonight. Um, Steve and I have been together our whole lives, literally. The story goes, our parents were friends, and the story goes that um, his mom and dad had just had Steve. Steve's the eldest of three and the youngest of three. And they bumped into each other in the park, and my husband was a brand new baby in a stroller. And my mom, who was about three months away from having me, looked at this baby and said, oh, a little boy, how cute, isn't it lovely? Or the English equivalent of whatever that was, because cute's not an English word. So whatever that was. And she said, oh, isn't he lovely? You had a boy. Wouldn't it be funny if we had a girl and they got together? So in those days, you, you didn't know what the sex of your child was. You know, I know we've got lots of millennials here. You didn't know in those days. So uh, it was kind of a guess. You, you weren't quite sure until that baby arrived. So there you go. The rest is history. That is exactly what happened. We, uh, we've pretty much been together since birth. However, Steve does tell the story a little differently because he says that um, he saw me at that point um, and immediately it was love at first bump. That's what he said. So cute, but not true, I'm sure. So uh, Steve and I really have been together. We have been on and off on and off, 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 and then on, 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 and then off again, and then on again, the whole time we dated for 25 years or whatever it was. Eventually we get married and we have uh, two boys. And um, just prior to that, we were about 19. We both grew up in the Salvation Army. We, kn we knew the ropes. We had bands, songsters. We were just busy, 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 kind of missing the point of why we go to the Salvation Army. We don't just go for the music. Of course, it's great to have that, but isn't it about the Lord? We kind of missed it. So we got to about 19, and Steve came over to America and went to Star Lake Camp, actually. And his plan was to get as far away from where he could be supervised as he possibly could and have a really good summer. That was the plan. When he arrived at the camp, he found out that he'd been allocated to be Christian, Ed Director, which was a little problem, seeing as he wasn't a Christian. So um, it didn't take long for people to kind of suss it out, and his life was changed dramatically that summer. And he came back, and uh, I hardly recognized him. He, he was so different. It was such an astounding transformation. And watching how his life was different and how he had changed spoke so much to me. Never underestimate how you can reach people just by virtue of the fact of the way you live your life. And so by virtue of the fact that Steve became saved uh, whilst he was at Star Lake and came back, he influenced me so greatly. I came to know the Lord in a much fuller and more meaningful way because of that. So I thank the Lord for that experience. So that was Star Lake. So moving on a few years. Um, so we have the boys and the, there's just something niggling us in our minds. And we know that we need to be in some kind of more, more important full-time ministry. We know it's not officership. We know it's not that. But we do not know what it's supposed to be. And then it was laid on our hearts by the Lord many, many times, a few times of which we chose to ignore it. But on the whole, we tried to listen. And the Lord was saying, I need you to move away. Now, you have to understand, I know you're family people. Family means everything. So you will understand this. Our whole family's there. Steve's family, my family, brothers, sisters, cousins, huge family. Okay. Will you want us to move away? Well, like how far? 20 miles? So, no, 6,000. 6,000 miles away. And uh, I need you to go to California. Now, that does not sound like a hardship. I understand that. Uh, and we thought, son, see, the family? That's a hard one. So we kind of shoved it to the back of our minds. 
carried on with life. We both had professions, we were busy, we were working, we were involved in the army, we loved it. Still, there's a niggling feeling. And so in the end, I said to Steve, okay, if we have to go to California, if we think that that's what it's gonna be, I'm gonna test it. I know we shouldn't test the Lord, but I'm going to. I'm gonna put a kind of fleece out, and I'm gonna say, okay, here's what we're gonna do. Um, we're gonna write to somebody in Northern California, and we're gonna say, here we are, the Lord's telling us we need to come. What do you want us to do? So I did, I wrote, nothing. Nobody even answered. I hope you're not watching from Northern California. I don't hold it against you, I promise. Nobody got back to us, so we put it to the back of our minds again, and we kept praying and kept praying. And then, 12 months later, back that thought comes. I said, I cannot settle. It is sitting, it's sitting. We've got to do something about this. So we started to really intensely pray. And I said, okay, what I'm going to say is, let's say to the Lord, if you want us to go there, we need to have a letter from them, because it was the days of letters and not emails. We need a letter from them on the doormat by Friday. And Steve said, that's ridiculous. It's Monday. And no one could possibly write the letter and get it to us in the mail in that period of time. Every day he ran down. He was determined to prove me wrong. And every day he went down to the mail, nothing. I said, it's Tuesday, Steve. Give it time. Wednesday, he runs down again. Same thing. Thursday, he runs down. Same thing. He said, Bob, there's nothing on the mat. Really, we, we have to let this go. Friday, what do you suppose I saw? What was on the doormat? The letter. And as far-fetched as that may sound, I love the way the Lord does that kind of stuff. He just reminds us who's in charge. It's not about the mail carrier, and it's not about how good the postal service is. It's about his will. And if I said Friday, he was proving to me, you need to go and be faithful. So we did. I'm gonna cut a very long story short. It kind of escalated and we got a phone call and we got invited for a weekend. I was gonna sing for a, a special concert they had at Pasadena Tab. And we were there, we flew in Thursday night and we flew out Sunday. And by Sunday afternoon, we were offered jobs as creative ministries directors for the Salvation Army. I said, okay, we get the message, Lord, thank you. We moved to America, very difficult move for us. Oh my gosh, I have never relied so much on the Lord in our lives. Even the difficulties, we sang about it this morning in my life is in your hands. When your tests and trials, they seem to get you down. It's not all, um, sweetness and light when you move away. There are so many very difficult things you have to deal with, like for instance, where's the grocery store? I don't even know what to buy. Huge, huge changes. The Lord was so, so faithful to us during that time. And uh, we continued to ask the Lord, what do you need of us? What do you need of us? We will do whatever. 22 years later, some of you know this story. Uh, my son goes to Long Beach Citadel. So we've been at TAB for 22, almost 23 years. And we love it, wonderful fellowship made friends. My son goes to Long Beach Citadel. The, the core has been through some tough times and he goes as musical director. He's only young and he has a young wife and he has a young baby. And he said, mom and dad, I really need some help here. This is a tiny core. We have no songs to speak of. We have no band, to, we have no music to speak of. Can you come and help? And so Steve and I again felt the calling of the Holy Spirit saying, this is the season. This is the season for you to step away from what I have given you and your comfort and all the things that you have here and to step into an unknown kind of situation. And so we went and uh, we'd been there for a short period of time and it ended up that James and Priscilla, his wife, they ended up going back to Tab for other reasons because the Lord had plans for them back there and we were supposed to be a Long Beach Citadel. Now I don't think if they hadn't gone, I don't think we'd have gone. I don't think we'd have thought about it. But isn't that the way the Lord works? Doesn't he have the perfect plan for us? And doesn't he say to us, I need you to do this. And if you're not gonna do it under your own steam, I'm gonna place people in your life that will draw you to where I need you to be. And I'm so grateful for people in my life that have done that, that have drawn us to where we need to be. Long Beach Citadel has a thriving ARC program. I am blessed every Sunday. As we drive home, Steve and I talk and say, look at the Lord. Look at what he's doing here. Men and women coming through the ARC, going into uniform senior soldiership, coming to know and love the Lord, joining the songsters and band. It blesses my heart. And they are a wonderful, wonderful, caring, loving fellowship that open their arms to the whosoever and say, come, be a part of this kingdom, be a part of God's kingdom. 
I think my prayer for myself, my family, and uh, just my general feeling about life is, is echoed in the sentiments of the hymn, Take My Life. I've always loved this song. So I want to leave that thought with you. Here's the words. Take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to thee. Take my moments and my days. Let them flow in ceaseless praise. Take my voice and let me sing always only for my king. Take myself and I will be ever only all for thee.
I'm aware that uh, you've been sitting for a little while and uh, perhaps your attention is a little bit stressed at the moment. But I'm going to ask you to just give me your attention for a few minutes so that we can think about this topic of the sacrament of living. That's the chapter from Tozer's book that we talked about in small groups and that you've uh, given some attention to already today. The word sacrament is an unusual term for us to use in the Salvation Army. We don't talk about sacraments much. Uh, we kind of avoid the topic altogether, which is a mistake, I believe. I think we have a theology of sacrament that we ought to talk more about. And maybe that's an opportunity for us this morning. The meaning of the word sacrament really describes the place where the sacred touches real life and the two become one. Where the sacred touches real life and the two become one. The church has had a challenge all through its history to somehow bring the spiritual truth, the reality of Jesus Christ, into real life so that we experience Christ at that level. I think one of the challenges that most of us face, I certainly have faced it, is that we somehow compartmentalize our lives. So we have real life over here. We have school life and work life and friend life. And then we have church life. And somehow the two often don't intersect in a way that brings meaning to either. And we even kind of wonder, well, how does this really work? And what, what is the intersection? And what am I missing sometimes? I think Jesus had a real challenge in his ministry to, to bring himself to people in a way that helped give meaning and purpose and sense to their real life. And one of those stories that's told to us in the Bible is in John chapter 4. And I'd like to just read a few verses from that and reflect a little bit about, on this interaction that Jesus had with the Samaritan woman. I'm sure it's a very familiar passage of Scripture to you if you've been attending church for any length of time at all. It's a great passage to preach on. And in this passage, we have a picture of a woman who very obviously lived in real life and had nothing to do with any kind of spiritual life as far as we can tell. She seemed to be aware of it. She lived in a very religious culture. She was aware all around her that religion had a big influence on life, but it didn't seem to really touch her life. You know the story probably well enough to know that she was coming to draw water from the well at a time when people didn't normally do that. It was usually a social activity to get water, but she was coming in the heat of the day at noon, the sixth hour, the Bible says, and she came by herself, and there she met a man, unexpectedly, a Jewish man, and she was a Samaritan. And you may have heard the story enough to know that those two really don't mix very well. Samaritans and Jews, they were both religious, they had common heritage in many ways, but they had different views about significant things. And so they didn't really talk to each other much. They avoided each other as much as possible. In fact, it was really unusual for Jesus to even go through the, the region of Samaria. Most Jews just avoided the region altogether and went way out of their way if they were traveling between Jerusalem and Galilee to avoid the place altogether. But for whatever reason, Jesus chose to go through Samaria. That was unusual. And then because it was noon and he was hungry and his disciples were hungry, he sent them in that, into town to find something to eat. And he stayed at this well. Kind of a divine appointment with this woman who comes and she sees him. And I, I, you can imagine that she was probably a, bit, a little bit put off. Well, what is this? He was very obviously Jewish by the way he was dressed. She knew immediately. And uh, she didn't really know what to do with that, but she expected she'd come, she'd get her water, and there'd be no conversation whatsoever. Because certainly she wasn't going to talk to him, and he wasn't going to talk to her. But she gets to the well, and he does talk to her. In fact, he asks her for something. He asks her if he could have a drink. And she responds, and take a look uh, at this. Verse, verse 7. John chapter 4, when the Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, will you give me a drink? The woman said to her, you're a Jew, and I'm a Samaritan woman. Why are you asking me for a drink? She's stunned. She, this was the least expected thing, that he would talk to her and ask her for something. This just doesn't happen in their society. And this is where Jesus' influence on her, it's really hard to, 
to trace it for a little while. It's like he's talking up here and she's understanding down here and they're not intersecting at all. They're just missing each other. Jesus answered her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that asked you for a drink, you'd have asked him and he would have given you living water. Sir, the woman said, you have nothing to draw with and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? She's thinking it's physical substance. She thinks there's some kind of water available and she has no idea what he's talking about. Are you greater than our father Jacob who gave us this well and drank from it himself as did all of his sons and his flocks and his herd? And Jesus answered, everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks the water I give him will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. I get the sense in the woman's next response is she just wants this thing to end. She doesn't know where this conversation is going. She just wants it to be over. She's a little bit intrigued by the idea of never having to come to this well again because this was a lot of work. So she does make a statement, but really it's the kind of statement that is designed to just end the conversation. This is it. I don't want to talk anymore. Sir, give me this water so they won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water. He told her, go call your husband and come back. I have no husband, she replied. He said to her, you're right when you said you have no husband. The fact is you've had five husbands. And the man you now have is not your husband. What you've just said is quite true. Let's pause there for a minute. Where in the world did that come from? What did that have to do with water and living water? And... How did Jesus know that? Jesus was opening the door to show this woman her life in a way that she hadn't thought of it before. And he was making clear to us who read this story all these years later that this woman lived in the real world and her real world was unaffected by anything to do with the spirit, the spiritual. Her life was just following a path that was going where it went. In that day and age, um, five husbands, uh, not the norm. And she was living a life that was uh, directed by other motives and other challenges. And who knows the pain that she'd had in her life and the difficulty she'd experienced and the rejection she'd felt from neighbors and friends. And that Jesus would open the door to that. Um, And how did he know? She responds, I see you are a prophet. (laughs) Um, Look what she does next. I see you are a prophet. Our fathers worshipped on this mountain, but you Jews claim that the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. I suppose even people who have had no influence in their lives of anything spiritual have questions in their mind that kind of give them an excuse to avoid the spiritual. I don't really have to pay attention to anything spiritual. I can see you are a prophet, but I've got this big question and that keeps me from worshiping anywhere. Our people say we're supposed to worship on Mount Gerizim, which is close to this city, and you Jews say it's supposed to be in Jerusalem, and I don't know which is right, and so... Who cares? You're a prophet. Maybe you know something I don't know. But it's Jesus' next response uh, which really begins to draw together this real world and spiritual world in a way that she begins to understand. Believe me, woman, a time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. Neither place. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know. For salvation is from the Jews. Yet a time is coming and now has come when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For they're the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God is spirit. And his worshipers must worship in spirit and truth. The woman said to him, I know that Messiah called Christ is coming when he comes. He'll explain everything to us. Then Jesus declared, I who speak to you am he. 
You see, Jesus opened the door for us with a very important truth. It isn't about where you worship. It isn't really even about how you worship. It is about worshiping in spirit and in truth. What did he mean by that? I think he meant that there's a dynamic in worship that has been missing, missing from this society, and that is the realm of the spirit. This woman lived in real world. I think she had a kind of a, a real world experience, but she didn't have any experience of the spirit, and Jesus is saying it isn't about where we worship. It's about bringing to real life the spirit and then giving them both to God. It's an integration between spirit and real life that solves the dilemma of compartmentalizing life, that satisfies this dualistic view that we often have about life, that there's real life and then there's spirit life. I think the tendency of most people, even today, is to kind of have one foot in real life and then kind of shift weight over to spirit life once in a while. For those of us who have some contact with church, we kind of understand that there is a dynamic about church and when we show up in church, we, we kind of do that thing. But then we go back to, to school. Then we go back to work. Then we go back to business. Then we go back to neighborhood. Then we go back to the mundane stuff of life. And the two don't really interact in a real meaningful way. Jesus opens the door to this woman to help her see that real worship isn't about place. Real worship is about recognizing that life is integrated. There is real life, there is true life, and there is spirit life. And if you really want to worship, if you're asking a serious question about worship, then real worshipers will worship in spirit and in truth. They'll bring integration to their lives and they'll live one life, not two. The woman goes back to the city, if you were to read the rest of the chapter, and she makes a stir among the people in the city, and pretty soon they all come out, and pretty soon they are all putting their faith in Jesus because he has opened the door to an integration between spirit and life in a way that they've never experienced before. I think this is the same problem so many of us have today. I think so many of us have a hard time bringing together this sacrament, this sacred, touching real life in a way that we experience God in the midst of it, that the two become one. I think music for many of us is a place of intersection between the sacred and the real. And maybe that's one of the things that uh, draws us to a camp like CMI. I was drawn to CMI. I, I grew up in this territory. You might not know my story. I'm, I grew up in this territory. I attended CMI. I was a student here. And I, I kept coming back year after year because I not only experienced the wonder of God, the sacredness of God in the music, but I also saw in the, in the teachers, in the, the faculty, that there was musical excellence. There was an accomplishment in real life. But they had been also able to integrate spiritual into their real life. It didn't seem to be put on. Their, who they were in Christ was who they were in music. Does that make sense? I'd met enough people that seemed to have two lives. But when I came here, maybe it was meeting the best uh, that the territory had to offer. And it made me hungry for an experience of one integrated life. The sacrament of living is the idea that in our living, Jesus Christ can be visible. The classic definition of sacrament is an, is an outward sign of an inward but invisible grace. And if we're really living the sacrament, then Christ is visible in us. 
This week I heard a story of an officer from Australia. He gave this testimony at a chapel service that I attended. And he told the story of how he first became aware that there was anything spiritual in the world at all. He had lived a completely secular life growing up in Australia, had no idea about church, had never heard anything about Jesus, and had no idea, certainly, of that there, there would be any importance to him. He'd gotten involved in drugs and in alcohol, and his life had become a mess. Uh, in fact, he said his life was intolerable, unbearable. And he was trying to get sober, and he was attending an AA group. And in the AA group, as people were sharing, and Alcoholics Anonymous is not the place necessarily you would expect uh, to have an encounter with the sacred, but that's his first encounter with the sacred. There were two people in the AA group who had something about their lives, and he, he didn't say that they gave a testimony. He didn't say that they said any words that reflected upon Jesus, but he knew from the first meeting that there was something about them that was different about everybody else in the group. He found out later they were members of the Salvation Army. And in fact, their lives were a sacrament. Their lives were a testimony to something that he didn't know and didn't understand that made him hungry later on to not only seek out the Salvation Army, but ultimately to seek out Jesus, which is more important. And he's now an officer in, in that territory. An amazing story of two Salvationists whose names I don't know who as far as I know didn't give a testimony or preach a sermon or say a word, they just interacted with this man in a way that made him aware that it was something different about the way they lived, their lives or sacrament. In Romans chapter 12, Paul gives us a, an indication about what this means. In the first two verses, I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your lives as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. If there's anybody in the New Testament who lives out for us what it means to live a sacramental life. Other than Jesus himself, certainly it was Paul. Paul was the opposite of this woman at the well in many ways. He, everything about his life was touched by the spiritual, or what appeared, what seemed to him to be the spiritual. He lived in church. He was a Pharisee of Pharisees. He follows all of the rules of being a Pharisee. He did all of the stuff which was supposed to bring the sacred into real life. But until he met Jesus, he really had no idea of what that was all about. But when he met Jesus, everything changed. Just like with that woman. It wasn't so much Jesus' words, I don't think, as much as it was his presence at the well. I who speak to you am he. I'm the Messiah. Jesus said to Paul, why are you persecuting me? In the vision that he had on the road, who are you? I am Jesus. And that encounter with the living Lord and the reception of the Holy Spirit in his life changed his life so that he became, his life became a sacrament. You can follow his life, the long life, a life of difficulties in ministry, and over and over again you see integration rather than division or separation of life. I think that's so important for all of us. And you're at a critical moment, many of you as students, to bring integration to your life, to worship God in spirit and in truth, that life might be a sacrament offered to God. A testimony not only to those around you as they see Christ in you, but an experience of real life as God intended it to be, infused by the Spirit of God, not compartmentalized life. And the way we get there is really simple. It's surrender. 
surrender of your life, of your dreams, your ambitions, and acceptance of all that God wants for you. It's allowing Christ the Holy Spirit to invade your heart, to invade your mind, to bring integration to your life. And so this morning, as we think about leaving this place, as we think about how our lives can be a sacrament where the sacred touches real life and the two become one, my challenge to you today is to surrender all that you are to all that God is and allow him to indwell you. We're going to sing a chorus that just describes this moment as a quiet moment of consciousness of Christ's presence. Maybe you've seen Christ in some of your instructors this week as I did as a student. And maybe you're aware of the integration that has taken hold in their life. They're not only good at music, excelling at real world things, but they know Christ. And it's not put on, it's not separate from them. And maybe what you've seen in them has made you hungry for that experience as well. And the door to that experience is acceptance of Christ's Spirit. So the invitation this morning as we sing this song is to come, to offer your life to Christ, and ask Him to integrate all that you are with all that He is. Let's sing this song together. In this quiet moment, place we know that we're in your presence we're in a place where we expect your spirit to be present and so we're in this world this spirit world father some of us have been guilty of having two lives and there's been little intersection between the two Father, this morning I pray that your Holy Spirit would come to each individual in this room as you came to the woman at the well, as you came to Paul on the road, and show yourself to each of us so that, Lord, we can embrace you fully and allow you by the power of your Holy Spirit to bring integration and truth and spirit to our lives so that we might be true worshipers. Father, you know us. We've been reminded of that by those, by the dancers. You know us. You know all about us. You know what our needs are. You know what the next step is for us. And so, Lord, I pray that your Holy Spirit would speak to us. That you would come to us individually in our hearts. That you would bring to our minds, Lord, the most important thing that we need to deal with today. So, Lord, we stand before your throne. We're conscious of your presence. But we pray, Lord, that your Holy Spirit will have his way with each of us today. In Jesus' name, I pray. We sing that chorus one more time, and I invite you to come to ask the Lord to be real to you, to transform you if you've been a less than true worshiper. 
sing it one more time. a great truth surrendering to who Christ is and what he desires for us I'm sure you've been introduced uh, I know you've been talking about this week about what it means to accept Christ as Savior that's really dealing with our past. That's recognizing who we are as sinners. As people who have broken God's law and require forgiveness from Him. Who have been disloyal to Him. But this song not only speaks of that, but also speaks of a greater surrender. Salvation really deals with our past. Who we've been the call of the Holy Spirit is not just to deal with a broken past it's also to receive a wonderful future and we do that by surrendering our hopes, our dreams, our ambitions, our goals our target for our life and giving that all to Christ and accepting what He has for us is best for us as we heard in the testimony as I'm sure we've heard many times this week, it's about being filled with God's Holy Spirit for the future, for today and for the future. And so as we sing this song, that's the challenge, not only to deal with the past, but also to recognize that God has wonderful plans for us. He desires integration for us. He desires our lives to be a testimony of His grace and His goodness, and He can do that in us. All He asks, is that we surrender the brokenness of our lives and accept His wholeness. As we sing the song, respond to the Holy Spirit.
Father, this morning we thank you for the writer of that song. We thank you for the concept, for the idea, for the biblical truth that surrender to your will is the best that we can do for with our lives. Father, forgive us for the tendency we so often have of exerting our will, trying to convince you that what we want is best for us. We're pushing you aside for living in two different worlds too often and not recognizing your dream, your desire that we might live a whole life, a full life, a true life, a life filled with your spirit. Father, we thank you this morning that we've been challenged, that we've responded. Father, we pray that you will go with us as we leave this place, that our lives might be a sacrament to you. That as other people look at our lives, they might sense something different about us, that our life would be a visible sign of an invisible grace because of your presence in us. Father, we thank you for all that you've done in us, all that you will do in us, for the way that you speak to us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As Pete continues to play that song, I'm going to ask the Wonderland Band to come back to the platform so that they can lead us uh, in the benediction. Continue to pray for those who are at the altar this morning. desire that I may feel no sense of possessing anything outside of you. I want to constantly be aware of your overshadowing presence and to hear your speaking voice. I long to live in restful sincerity of heart. I want to live so fully in the spirit that all my thoughts may be as sweet incense ascending to you and every act of my life may be an act of worship. Therefore, I pray the words of your great servant Paul. I beseech thee, to purify the motives of my heart with the unspeakable gift of your grace that I may love you perfectly and be worthy to praise you. And all this I confidently believe you grant me through the name of Jesus Christ, your Son. Amen. Let's stand as we prepare to go home, to school, to work, to our core, and go forth. <laughs>